I'm in charge of just over 500 professional analysts in the Department for Work and uh, Pensions. Uh, so economists, statisticians, social researchers, operational researchers. Um, the statisticians pull together all of our data, our survey data, our administrative data. They publish that. Uh, the social researchers run our research program, which uh, at the moment is around about 25 million Australian dollars uh, a year. Um, I have teams of people who build uh, computer simulation models uh, to simulate the impacts of uh, different policies and a whole raft of people doing option generation, option appraisal, planning, implementation, evaluation. So a whole raft of things. It's the best job um, in the world. Uh, it is never uh, dull, I can um, tell you. Um, and one of the things uh, as a civil servant that, uh, that we do uh, is make sure that everything we do is focused on influencing the decisions being made by ministers or senior officials um, in the department. So if what we are doing is not ultimately going to impact on a decision somewhere on the line, we probably shouldn't be doing it because we've got more than enough um, to be getting um, on with. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a whole pile of slides. Uh, Alan Hayes has been uh, worrying a, a lot about how long I'm going to take. Um, and uh, when I told him just for a joke this morning, I got another 10 slides. Never, you've, <laughs> never have you seen a paler man um, than, than Alan. Um, so, uh, I'll uh, just going to see if this... Okay, so uh, what am I going to talk about? Um, uh, I'll, I'll briefly t t tell you what my department does uh, and uh, how it sort of fits in with what different departments in, the, uh, in Australia do. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about the UK fiscal context and then I'm going to canter through at quite high speed uh, three uh, areas of policy around employment, around child poverty, a little bit about on some of our uh, work with families and, and helping the, the most uh, complex uh, families. And then I'm going to have a go at predicting uh, the results of the ashes using, using rigorous analysis. Um, uh, and uh, you might think that's going to be quite a short section, but... Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, the key thing is there's, there's kind of a few, th a few themes that will be common uh, throughout all this. The, the first is really that... Uh, as the UK comes out of recession, our sort of basic policies, our basic institutions work well for the vast majority of people. Um, but having said that, there are some long-standing issues that we have not yet cracked in the UK, and I think is common to most countries. We haven't cracked a lot of the issues around youth unemployment, about families with complex needs, um, around folk with mental health problems, etc. So there's a series of sort of intractable issues uh, which uh, everybody's trying to solve, and, and I guess a conference like this will have a lot of evidence to support that sort of thinking. Um, and actually one of the themes, therefore, is, well, actually, it is difficult to find answers to these questions, so how do you stimulate the innovation of policymaking? How do you innovate and experiment and do so in a way that is uh, rigorous in terms of uh, the evaluation, uh, rigorous in terms of the data you're using, so that you can identify solutions that you might be able to scale up. So that's kind of the theme is, how do you innovate in uh, policy uh, making? Um, and a, a, a quick whistle-stop tour of the Department for Work and Pensions. We employ just under 100,000 uh, people now. Uh, so we bring together all of the policy on benefits, Pensions, disability benefits, unemployment benefits, etc. We're responsible for policy on employment programs. Um, and we also are the delivery agency for all of those services. So we pay the benefits, we deliver the employment programs, sometimes through uh, private sector providers. Uh, and so most of our people are employed in processing benefits, working in contact centres, uh, working face to face with the unemployed, etc. So we are a big uh, organisation, and I guess that portfolio uh, goes across what currently goes on in Australia in social services and human services uh, and the employment department, etc. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a mix and, and quite a different uh, institutional um, structure. So um, uh, the, the six objectives for the department uh, are these. Uh, a, a, a really important one, uh, number one, our Secretary of State, very, very passionate about social justice, which is very much about the hardest to help in society. How do we actually ensure that the hardest to help are getting on in society? Um, 
encouraging work and working make, making work pay uh, a kind of a standard one. So a lot of these are not not uh, uh, unusual. Uh, enabling disabled people to fulfil their potential, etc., uh, etc. Et and as you walk, as you work down the list uh, to the bottom. Um, improving services to the public and delivering value for money. So quite a lot of what I do is actually trying to identify the most effect effective and efficient way of delivering public services, right down to what explains productivity differences between different contact centres. So what actually is the best way of organising these scarce um, uh, resources? Um, and uh, to, to move on, um, you can't understand anything that's going on in the UK at the moment without understanding the fiscal uh, context. Um, the starting point is, uh, this shows uh, the cumulative uh, progress of three recessions. Um, the bottom one is our current recession, which we are now emerging from. But six years after the start of the recession, GDP has just got back to the level of 2008. Uh, that was announced uh, last week. Our two previous recessions, actually, we'd recovered from much, much more quickly. So this has been a long, long-standing uh, recession. Um, and against that, our public finances had got into a real mess around about 2008-9. So this shows the difference between receipts from taxation and expenditure. And the gap peaks at around about 11% of GDP uh, in 2010-ish. So a vast gap in public expenditure uh, terms. And what you can see is a projection of how public expenditure is going to fall over the next uh, four, five, six years as the government tries to get the books to balance again. And around about 80% of that gap that is being closed is being closed by public expenditure cuts, 20% through increases in taxation. So some really, really painful things have already happened, and some more painful things will continue to happen for the foreseeable uh, future. So, I, so you, you've got to see that as the, the starting point for the context. Um, and one of the things that the government has done uh, in response to that is introduce what we call a welfare cap, which is a commitment that expenditure on working age benefits will not exceed a certain envelope over the next three, four, uh, five years. So the second line down from the top captures, as a proportion of GDP, our working age benefit expenditure, and that projection is for that to come down as a proportion of GDP. And the sort of thing that we have already legislated uh, to do to actually make that happen is, for example, that all working age benefits are only going to increase by 1% for each of the next three years, irrespective of the level of inflation. So there's some pretty tough uh, tough uh, uh, times ahead uh, for folk on benefits. We've also made some uh, means testing to what was previously our universal child benefit for the first time since it was introduced in the late 1970s. So uh, the fiscal context is, uh, is interesting uh, and challenging, um, but there's also been some interesting trends, and this is kind of one of my random slides, uh, over the last few years as a consequence of the global financial crisis, uh, which has had some big impacts, sometimes surprising impacts, on the life of families. So this uh, chart shows trends in the composition, the housing tenure composition of the working age population, and you can see in recent years a big, big decline in the proportion of people who've got mortgages, who are buying a house with a mortgage. So access to mortgage finance has become much, much more restricted, even though interest rates are really, really low. And you're seeing a really big increase in people renting in the private sector, which is the most unstable sector, really, for, uh, for tenure uh, certainty. Um, and a lot of people now staying at home into their mid-20s, late-20s, even early-30s as a consequence. So some quite profound changes in the composition of family life that are going on. Um, so that's a bit of background, just uh, to give you a sense of the fiscal context. Uh, and I'm going to move on uh, to talk a little bit about what's going on in the labour market and some of the policies that we've been implementing over uh, recent uh, years. So um, the starting point, actually, is, is quite an interesting one. You'll recall my chart that looked at GDP trends over three recessions. Uh, this chart looks at employment uh, trends over three recessions. And it shows that actually in the current recession, the top line, employment is actually going through the roof um, at the moment. So although GDP has been way down, employment is rising at a record um, rate. And this is one of the paradoxes in the UK uh, economy, uh, such that in, in the last 12 months, the rate of job growth, and this is all in the private sector, because the public sector is coming down, the rate of job growth is at record levels. Um, 
And if you look at the employment rate, we are quite close to a historic high in the employment rate. This shows the long-run trends in the employment rate split between men and women and all. Women at a very high, uh, at, are now at a historical high. Men way below the, level of the rates of employment that we saw in the 1970s. Uh, but overall, the employment rate um, actually heading upwards quite sharply. And a lot of that is actually people working longer as they approach state pension age. Uh, there's some really interesting trends in there. Uh, but I haven't covered that in the uh, presentation because Alan told me uh, to be uh, shorter than I was planning to be. Um, uh, and if you uh, uh, complete that picture of those three recessions, the other thing that is really interesting is the bottom line shows that unemployment got nowhere near as high as it did in the previous two recessions. So GDP is much, much worse but employment is much, much better, and unemployment is much, much better. And one of our uh, beliefs is that the core unemployment benefit regime we've got that keeps people actively seeking work has been very, very effective, actually, at, at keeping employment levels up and unemployment uh, down. And actually, I haven't got the picture which shows the inactivity rate, but if you looked at the inactivity rate, our inactivity rate is falling at the moment, which is in sharp contrast to, say, the USA, which has got good employment growth and uh, falling unemployment, but they've actually got quite a big increase in inactivity uh, rates and in particular on uh, sickness and disability uh, roles. So our sickness uh, roles are coming down at the moment. So there's a lot of positive trends in the labour market. Um, and it seems to me that um, the quest in any labour market uh, regime uh, is very much to find a way of differentiating the services between different segments of the population. And I think there's a little bit of a tendency to think about how you can predict the likelihood of somebody being a long-term unemployed, uh, at risk, say, of say being long-term unemployed, uh, and then think about what is the service that I would give them that is different because of that risk. Uh, and we tried to turn it around a little bit in the UK and say, well, actually, um, what are the different services that I might try and give different segments of the population? And given those services that we think are most effective, how can we identify as soon as possible that somebody's at risk of becoming in that circumstance at some point? So start with service uh, differentiation. And I've just put up a couple of examples of research reports uh, that the department has sponsored. Um, the one on the right is a particular favourite of mine because uh, we actually trialled the Australian Job Seekers Classification Instrument um, in the UK uh, a few uh, years ago. We had to adjust this question, so... Um, any reference to barbecues and sunshine were removed from the uh, questionnaire, and we replaced them uh, with uh, questions about soggy chips and defeat at cricket. Um, uh, and it turns out they're quite useful uh, predictors of, uh, of, uh, of uh, people's progress uh, in the labour market. Um, so we do learn a lot from uh, the Australians, and, and I've been uh, engaging with uh, quite a few colleagues in Australia over the last decade or so, and that sort of information exchange is something actually uh, that has always been really, really um, important. Um, in terms of our, uh, our basic uh, work uh, programme, we use a lot of private providers using a payment by results uh, model and very much a black boat box approach to this. So after six, nine, 12 months, it depends on the, the case in question, uh, a person who's been with our publicly provided Job Centre Plus services will be transferred to what we call our work programme. Um, and uh, depending on the outcomes for those individuals, a series of payments will be triggered to those providers. So uh, initially, uh, a, 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 a sort of a connection payment. If somebody has been in work for 26 weeks, uh, an initial outcome uh, payment. And then as somebody stays in work uh, for further weeks, uh, then additional payments uh, flow from that. So actually the payment sort of really backloaded to keeping people um, in work. And in terms of the segmentation uh, of different groups, um, you don't need to look at the details of this, but this shows uh, that actually we make quite different levels of payments for different types of uh, claimant. Um, the peak one is people who are on our sickness benefit, or our new sickness benefit, who've been transferred from our old sickness benefit, so have been out of em employment for many, uh, many years. And they can trigger some quite large uh, payments to providers if they can get them back into work. 
So we try and structure the payments to incentivize the providers to devote the resources that we think is appropriate uh, and reflecting the difficulty of getting people um, back into work. And what is common in this area, as in quite a few areas of the UK, is that the coalition government that came in in 2010 has been very, very ambitious and radical uh, in terms of its policy making. Pretty much every area of policy is live, but also we are still in the early days of understanding the effect of these policies. So what we don't have is really concrete evidence about whether these sorts of policies are having a, a significant impact yet. And we have a big evaluation program to get to the bottom uh, of that. Um, and building on that segmentation uh, theme, uh, we've done some quite interesting things doing some data sharing between my department, Department of Work and Pensions, and our mis Ministry for Justice, who are responsible for policy on, amongst other things, um, offenders um, and prisoners. Um, and data sharing is something that is very, very difficult to get going um, in the UK. We have some very restrictive legislation. Um, but this shows uh, an example where if we match together information about ex-prisoners with their their spells on unemployment benefits, it turns out that the likelihood of them staying on unemployment benefit is pretty much identical to the likelihood of a non-prisoner, which is a bit of a surprising um, outcome. Um, and actually, that sort of flow-off benefit is one of our key metrics that we use uh, to determine whether we are successful. But if you actually then say, well, what's the likelihood that they're on benefit or some other benefit at some point after uh, that spell starts, you get this picture. Uh, and it turns out that the ex-prisoners are more, something like 60% more likely to be on benefit at any point uh, uh, than, than the non-ex-prisoners. Um, and the reason for that, when you piece it together, and this is just a, a, a single example, um, you can see the, uh, the solidish line showing spells on uh, job seekers' allowance. Um, and then at the bottom, you see little P's, I think they are, um, which are spells in prison. Um, so it turns out that lots of people are leaving benefit at the same speed, but they're not going into work, they're going in, in and out of prison. Um, and one of the things that we've done as a consequence of that piece of evidence is that we now fast-track ex-prisoners to additional help from day one of a claim. So there's an example where, without that sort of data sharing, we simply wouldn't have had the basis for uh, that uh, policy. Um, one intractable uh, issue uh, that I mentioned is uh, youth uh, unemployment. So in the UK, although we're not in such a bad position as some of our European uh, compatriots, where you see some really extraordinary levels of youth unemployment, nonetheless, the proportion of young people under 25 who are not in education, employment and training is still stubbornly uh, high. And so going back to the, the start, this would be one group where we're thinking, well, actually, no, we haven't cracked this yet. So uh, one of the things that we're doing then in response to that uh, is actually trying to stimulate some real innovation uh, in policy making and in policy delivery for the young unemployed. And one of the mechanisms we're using for that are social impact bonds. Uh, bonds is a little bit of a misnomer in that. But effectively, this is a model where uh, a private individual or a charitable foundation or some other source of cash is willing to stump up some money to fund a service which is targeted at the young unemployed such that if they achieve certain outcomes, the state will then pay them uh, a, a, a cash uh, payment to uh, recognise their achievement of uh, helping the young person uh, progress. Um, and we've got 10 uh, uh, such investment bonds at the moment in this area and quite a few others are, are emerging in other parts of the UK uh, government so you may well uh, be aware of the, uh, the Peterborough Prison Social Impact uh, Bond which is uh, paying, uh, uh, paying out payments for reducing re-offending um, rates. Um, and actually, uh, you don't need to look at the detail but this is the sort of schedule that we have of payments that would be triggered uh, to uh, a social impact uh, organisation uh, depending on outcomes. So things like reducing uh, truancy, uh, things like uh, improving uh, qualifications, etc., etc., all with different um, rates. And the trick here is to actually try and make sure that uh, the rates are uh, commensurate with the challenges uh, faced. Uh, and this is an, a, a, a classic example of innovation where actually you're almost uh, making it up as you go along and learning and testing 
uh, all the time. So that is one um, example. Um, and we've just had some of our uh, uh, early research on this. It's largely qualitative uh, research. Um, but some really interesting uh, issues, particularly that it's much easier to contact and main contact with uh, people at risk of becoming a NEET, or not employment, educational training, while they're at school, because there's an institutional structure that you can actually um, engage with. Much, much harder to retain contact with those people who are already out of school, in the labour market, maybe a little bit chaotic in their lives. Quite a difficult group to actually maintain a relationship with. Um, but some really sort of basic learning in a sense of how important it is to work with a school around the rhythm of the school year. So, you know, there's no point starting a, a, a programme in a school just as you're approaching the summer exams um, in the UK. You've really got to get your timing uh, right. Um, but also some really interesting findings where um, charitable providers who perhaps haven't always been concentrating on the bottom line in terms of the cash flow uh, of, uh, that their activities are generating, actually spending a lot more effort understanding the performance of their uh, activities to understand the cash flow that they're getting uh, from different outcomes for uh, different um, groups. So some really, really interesting learning um, in its early days. Now, Alan, do you want me to carry on? Is that okay? Thank you very much. So um, uh, th that's where we are on uh, youth unemployment. Um, let me move on to uh, some trends in child poverty, and then I'll say a little bit about universal credit, which is um, our biggest reform by uh, some distance. Um, I'm going to start off just by putting up a slide that shows trends in mean and median incomes before and after housing costs, because this is the slide that sort of squares the previous slides that I've shown you. So GDP not really recovering very quickly, but employment recovering very, very quickly, that is being, the, the, the thing that is squaring that is that real wages actually are much, much lower um, than, they, than we would have expected given usual trends um, in wages. And as you can see, um, by any measures of income, we are sort of back to 12, 13 years ago in terms of our real incomes. So there's a lot of families, a lot of parts of the population who are struggling at the moment in terms of their um, incomes. The, the one group who are not struggling so much are uh, people over pension age who have actually been uh, quite well protected by a lot of our policies. So uh, the, the starting point is that incomes are falling. Um, and if you look at long-run trends in child poverty, we've got a series back to 1961, um, a consistent series back to 1961. Again, we've got it on a before housing costs and an after housing costs uh, basis. You see some remarkable stability until the late 1970s, a big, big increase, um, and then sort of a steady decline um, since then. So things moving in um, the right direction. And if you sort of dive in a little bit more on those more recent uh, times, um, we've actually got a series of measures of child poverty which we monitor on a regular uh, basis. So we've got the standard sort of 60% median income uh, at, a cu at the current point in time. We've got uh, a measure of absolute poverty that relates to uh, real incomes uh, 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 seven or eight years ago. Uh, we've then got low income combined with material deprivation, which are families with kids or kids in particular who haven't got access to a basket of uh, goods. Um, and then we've got severe poverty, which is, uh, sets, the, sets the bar at 50% of median income as opposed to 60%. So a lot of those trends are sort of heading in the right um, direction, uh, but are probably not really expected to improve a huge amount over the next few years, which is a challenge for the government because in legislation we have a commitment by the government to eradicate child poverty. So one of the challenges for the government uh, is actually to uh, find uh, the policies that will actually uh, achieve that uh, you know, quite striking ambition. Um, and there are quite a few trends moving in the right direction which are helping us. So this shows the employment rate of uh, single parents split by age of youngest child. Um, the dotted line in the middle is the average employment rate of single parents, which as you can see is up about 15 percentage points um, over the whatever 20 years or so uh, of that uh, series. So the employment rate for single parents is now at a historic high uh, in the UK and actually continued to grow throughout the recession. Um, one of the reasons for that actually is that we've, we've actually made it a condition of receipt of benefit for uh, lone parents to be uh, more, much more uh, actively seeking uh, work. 
Um, and if you sort of move that through then, the number of children in workless households has been falling steadily uh, over recent times, which again is another positive uh, trend. Um, and if you actually look then at the, uh, uh, the, the, the breakdown of families in child poverty, um, the bottom two areas are those people who are in measured child poverty who are out of work, and the top three areas are those who are either in work as single parents or with one earner couples or two earner couples. Um, so the really interesting challenge now in the UK is that actually child poverty is much more of an in-work phenomenon than an out-of-work uh, phenomenon. Uh, and it's at this point that universal credit uh, comes in. So um, some of you may have uh, heard a little bit about um, universal uh, credit. Um, when the Secretary of State uh, in Duncan Smith uh, uh, took over in, in 2010, he had a very, very clear vision uh, for universal credit um, because actually it's based on a blueprint that his uh, think tank, the Center for Social Justice, had developed over the previous 12 to 18 months. She, probably the most detailed blueprint and most thoughtful uh, piece of work that I've ever seen by a think tank, a 385-page tome with some pretty rigorous um, analysis in it. Um, and what's uh, impressive in the document, actually, is that the uh, clear objective of the policy is absolutely uh, stark. And the purpose of the policy is to reduce further the number of workless households. So to maximise the number of households where at least one person is in work. And that leads to quite a few issues about policy design, about, well, what does that mean for the incentives for the first earner, the second earner? What does it mean about the incentives to do mini-jobs of only a few hours? Um, but actually, the design is very much focused on that key objective, and everything else is secondary to that, reduce the number of workless households. And to give you an example of one element of that uh, that flows from that... Um, no, sorry, let me, before, I, before I go to that... Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of universal credit before I give you a thing. Um, uh, what universal credit does is it replaces all of our means-tested benefits and tax credits, which are currently paid to around about 7.5 million households. Uh, and those benefits and tax credits, so the top three are tax credits, working tax credit, child tax credit, those are currently administered by our revenue and customs. Um, the bottom uh, sliver, uh, HB, housing benefit, is currently administered by our local authorities. It's a national system, but administered by 400 local authorities using 370 different computer systems and 27 IT packages. Um, and then the ones in the middle, income support, employment support allowance, job seekers allowance, they are paid to uh, the unemployed, to people on sickness benefits, uh, and in the main carers and uh, single uh, parents. S and each one of those benefits at the moment has its own specific conditionality uh, regime, and people can move between those benefits depending on how their circumstances uh, change. What universal credit does is bring all of those together into a single integrated payment. Um, and rather than having uh, sort of rough, uh, sorry, very solid lines between different conditionality regimes, you have six broad groups within universal credit where you would have tailored conditionality depending on the exact challenges faced by any particular individual uh, or family, which extend from no work requirements, which would be for people who are doing lots of work or are clearly completely unable to work, right down to some uh, uh, issues uh, in, in the middle um, where not only are we dealing with potential conditionality or some requirements on those who are out of work, but also on people who we think actually could be doing uh, a little bit more uh, work if they were enabled to. So this is actually starting to engage with people who are already in the labour market for um, the first time. Um, and one example uh, of the design of the benefit uh, that, uh, that is novel um, is this. This shows your uh, disposable income after childcare costs uh, under the uh, old system, which is kind of the, uh, the red line, and then the is that blue? I'm colorblind, so anyway, um, uh, under, the, under the new um, uh, system. Uh, and what this uh, shows, actually, is that in the old system, um, you didn't get any help with your childcare costs until you reached 16 hours in work. So it's very much a cliff edge. And at that point, your tax credits kick in, your entitlement to childcare support kicks in. 
What universal credit does is it extends entitlement to childcare right down uh, the hours uh, distribution um, with the express uh, aim of trying to encourage people to do some work uh, and to enable them to do that by helping out with their childcare costs. Um, and that picture of the change in the budget constraint, the incentives to work different numbers of hours, is common uh, for all groups, whether you look at childcare or not. But I think childcare is quite an interesting uh, angle on that. And you've got to look at, the, though, that the flatness of that line actually shows that even when you work quite a lot of more hours, your disposable income doesn't increase that much. So this doesn't really crack, uh, you know, it doesn't really crack um, the in-work uh, poverty trap or the in-work uh, poverty challenge um, that much. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the things with a reform this big um, is that actually we are rolling it out in a very, very measured and controlled way and very much in a learning as we go. So starting with the least complex cases in a small number of uh, regions of the country and then gradually starting to increase the complexity of the cases we bring in. So I think in the last couple of weeks we've started to deal with our first couples. Um, and um, the, uh, the philosophy behind that rollout is something that actually uh, has been there from day one. So our minister in the Lords, Lord Freud, uh, who's been one of the architects of this uh, policy, um, always took the view that this is a policy change that is so large that there is just no way that you're going to be able to get the parameters of it right on day one. It's just too big, and in particular, the likely behavioural responses are going to be uncertain. So we've spent a lot of time trying to get the parameters as good as we think we can, uh, but then the government has taken a power in the Welfare Reform Bill to allow it to experiment with a lot more elements of the design of the benefit as we roll it out. So, for example, not only can we experiment with, for example, the conditionality regime, which we've done a lot of over the years, we can also experiment, if it was deemed appropriate, with rates of benefit, with benefit withdrawal rates, and other elements of the benefit design, trying to ensure that it maximises the outcomes we're trying to achieve, which is increased employment rates and reduced workless households. And so we have some very detailed plans of how, as the number of cases within the universal credit envelope increases, the sample size increases, the amount of testing and learning that we're doing um, is then building upon um, those cases. Um, and this, I think, is, is certainly unique in the UK in terms of, of, of a measured um, approach. Uh, a, a key element uh, in this area, as in many areas of policy at the moment, is just making sure that we are really understanding the whole behavioural change aspects of it, the behavioural insight. Um, as Paul and I were uh, discussing uh, yes, yesterday, um, as an economist, one of the things that, I, that embarrasses me is economists calling behavioural science behavioural economics, um, as if the economist just invented something which actually has existed for um, many uh, years. But actually, the rigorous application of behavioural science is something that we're doing a lot of in a lot of policy uh, areas. Um, and some of you may well be aware of the uh, behavioural insight team that we've got at the Cabinet Office in the UK, the Nudge Unit, um, as they're sometimes known, um, who have been quite influential across uh, government uh, trying to raise the standards of the application of behavioural science. Uh, interestingly, in the last six months, they have just been mutualised so they are now jointly owned by the Cabinet Office, uh, an external trust, and the employees of the uh, Behavioural Insight uh, Unit, which is leading some interesting questions about um, commercial um, relationships. Um, so the application of behavioural science, really, really important. Um, you don't need to read this in any detail, but this is just an example of how in universal credit we're trying to go from the delivery mechanisms, the levers, and what the perception of those levers would be, right through to how claimants, customers will respond to those, ultimately trying to influence them to make decisions which we're after, which is our policy outcomes. So this is our sort of framework for thinking about the application of behavioural science uh, to um, the rollout uh, of a policy. Uh, and uh, going back to, to where I started, one, one of the interesting things we've therefore got is now a single benefit that includes people out of work and in work. Um, and one of the things that we are now experimenting with are some pilots and trials about how we encourage the progression of people once they're in work. So once you're doing a small number of hours, 
What are the factors that would enable you to do a larger number of hours? What are the barriers and how could we uh, break them uh, down? So this is a, a, a new uh, challenge that we haven't had uh, before and we've got, again, a test and learn approach. Use uh, uh, behavioral science to identify the sorts of interventions that might be successful. Trial those interventions in a local uh, sense. Learn from them. Are they scalable? Are they not scalable? So a completely new challenge, quite a novel challenge um, for us. Um, so that's universal uh, credit. Uh, Alan, how am I doing for time? I'm doing fine for time. Thank you. I, you didn't expect to say that, did you? Um, so <laughs> I'm going to um, I'm going to move on uh, to uh, some quite interesting uh, trends uh, in family life, and a little bit on the on where we are on the policy on that. As you can see, this is a whistle stop uh, tour. Um, I, I, I pulled a few of these together on a, an afternoon in front of the computer, um, which seemed to me quite interesting. This shows uh, uh, recent trends in teenage con or conceptions uh, in the UK, but in particular some remarkably sharp reductions. I apologise for the scale not going to zero, but um, that's, what it, that's what I had on the, on the internet. Um, some remarkable falls in the conception rate amongst uh, uh, the under-20s, and, and therefore a really, really big fall at the moment going on in terms of uh, teenage uh, pregnancies. Uh, and if you actually look at the outcomes of those uh, pregnancies, um, quite a significant increase um, in the uh, rate of legal abortion, particularly amongst uh, younger uh, women. So not only are there fewer conceptions, a higher proportion of those are ending uh, in abortion, which is obviously further reducing the number of actual teenage births. So um, th this, is th this, is, this is quite a remarkable trend in the UK that I don't think we've really got to the bottom of what's uh, driving that. Um, if you look at other social trends, this is a, uh, our uh, headline measure of uh, crime in the UK. The top line is, comes from uh, survey data, so we believe this is consistent over time. Um, but some really huge reductions um, in the level of crime that we've seen over the last 15, uh, 18 years in the UK. No apparent tick up in the recession, despite some concerns that that would uh, occur. So some very, very positive social trends there. Um, and if you look at uh, trends in the first-time entrance into the youth uh, justice system, some really, really sharp reductions uh, in, the, in recent uh, years. So some really, really positive things um, going on uh, at the moment, um, some of which I think don't get the, the attention perhaps that they deserve, and I'd be really interested as we get through the conference to hear uh, if any, any of the papers that folk are presenting or, uh, have got sort of explanations for some of these uh, trends, because I think the jury is quite out in the UK. Um, and if I extend that again to look at, uh, at drug use, uh, reported drug use, particularly amongst uh, younger people, again, has come down sharply um, in recent years. So, um, so, so what we've got is generally, you know, from, from what I started is, we've got, for most of the population, uh, actually a series of very, very positive trends, whether it be employment, whether it be crime, whether it be teenage pregnancy, etc., etc. Lots and lots of positive trends. But then you have some pockets of intractable difficulties. We've talked about the youth unemployed as one example. Another example is what we call our troubled families, who are the 120,000 or so families who have got complex problems, often to do with drug and alcohol misuse, um, children truanting, uh, children uh, uh, being uh, picked up for antisocial uh, behaviour, uh, usually parents not in work. Um, and they, this uh, group of 120,000 families uh, is estimated to cost uh, the UK taxpayer, either directly or indirectly, around about £9 billion uh, a year, so whatever, $15, $18 million, um, uh, dollars, uh, billion, dollars, sorry. Um, and so what we've got here is a, a programme where local authorities are being encouraged to tackle uh, the needs of these families in a much more holistic way uh, than previously, very much building on a lot of best practice that we've seen over the years. Um, and I guess it won't be a surprise to you that the key sort of elements of this are the caseworker approach, the dedicated caseworker approach, who takes responsibility for bringing together all of the myriad services that these families are, taking, uh, are, 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 are uh, experiencing. Um, but who, if they try to navigate through that sort of blizzard of things themselves, would almost certainly not succeed. So having the dedicated caseworker, um, absolutely critical. Um, and um, the number of uh, uh, families 
turned around, as the language goes, has been uh, increasing sharply as the resources have been deployed over uh, recent uh, years. So some really, really positive trends um, in this area. And again, some very, very innovative approaches uh, to uh, funding uh, uh, different sorts of new uh, intervention. Um, I'm going to move on again, so troubled families, lots and lots going on. Uh, another area where we've got major reform is in our child maintenance uh, system. So uh, uh, one thing that I didn't t tell you is the things I'm not going to talk about is the fact we've got the biggest reform to our state pension uh, in 100 years uh, going on. We've got some major reforms to our private pensions going on. I'm not going to mention that. We've just changed all of our disability benefits, the biggest reform in 25 years. Not going to mention that. So um, just to give you a sense of all the other stuff um, that's going on. So as well as universal credit and the work programme, we've also got a reform to uh, child maintenance. Um, and uh, the starting point for that is that if you actually look at uh, the proportion of kids who don't live with both, parent, both birth parents, this shows it by age. Uh, by the time you're getting to 15, uh, 16, you're getting close to half uh, of kids not living in a family with both uh, birth parents. And as a consequence, uh, the amount of child maintenance uh, that is being um, uh, uh, that is that is due uh, is quite a significant uh, amount um, of cash. Um, and it's worth saying that our previous uh, child maintenance arrangements have not been a towering uh, success. So uh, roughly. Uh, the, 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 roughly the transfer of resources between parents has been just over a billion pounds a year in recent years, and that's cost half a billion pounds a year to administer. So um, the average cost per pound transferred has been pretty high. So the complete change in the philosophy of our child maintenance reform is to try and do all we can to encourage parents to work out arrangements uh, between uh, themselves. Um, and again, we've applied some behavioural insight and we've done a lot of research and qualitative research to understand what is it that maximises the chances of parents working out them things for themselves in the most amicable way possible, which is likely, therefore, to enable them to remain in contact with um, their uh, kids that they are no longer with, uh, living with. Um, and so uh, you can see all this stuff on, on the internet. Uh, we've got a lot of advice uh, uh, available uh, for families. Um, but the core of the reform has been a move to uh, a charging uh, mechanism. So as of, I think, a couple of weeks ago, uh, it is now the case that uh, if you want uh, an assessment of how much maintenance should be transferred between uh, parents, we'll charge you £20 for that assessment. So not a, not a huge amount. If you not only want that assessment, you also want to, to, us to arrange the payment of that maintenance, we will charge the parent who is making the payment 20% on top of their maintenance liability, and we will deduct 4% from the parent receiving it. So some pretty big financial disincentives um, to rely on the state to make these, uh, to make these uh, transfers. And the early, uh, the early days of this, is, uh, the findings are a, a higher proportion of people making, uh, making uh, arrangements between themselves without coming uh, to the new child maintenance uh, service. Um, we've got a really uh, nice uh, child maintenance uh, app, uh, which, uh, uh, which actually has been uh, really, really successful, co-designed with uh, parents to make sure that it is easily navigable um, and, and meets uh, their needs. Um, and I think we have uh, 17 pilots going on of uh, different types of help and support for separated families, a couple of which uh, learn directly from uh, Australia. And, and these are quite small-scale trials, so they're not randomised control trials where you can learn a lot quantitatively, but it's very much getting that sort of qualitative understanding of what is likely to work, and then from that, how would you scale it up? Okay, that's good. Um, so... Um, some big themes there. Um, lots and lots of things going well, um, but some really, really intractable tractable problems. But I hope a sense of the innovative approach we're trying to take to find solutions. So very much sort of a test and learn approach. And I just wanted to, 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 to pass on two sort of final thoughts on stimulating innovation, because I think this is something that isn't just for governments uh, to do. Um, so uh, the one on the left is a, is a really, really interesting initiative from our ministry uh, for justice. 
um, which is where uh, anyone who is working with uh, offenders and is trying to get offenders into a better place, either in terms of employment or in terms of reducing reoffending rates, can pass the details of the people they're working with to the statisticians in the Ministry of Justice, who will, as far as they can, find a matching sample, a control sample, um, and who will then do the analysis of whether there's any additionality uh, there. So this is trying to give um, off, often the, the non-government voluntary organisation access to some really, really hard data about whether their uh, interventions um, are working. Um, similarly, we've got some real moves to enable people to come into uh, government now and actually work with our uh, data sets, uh, both for uh, the practical purposes of thinking about policy, but also for research purposes. And I'm not sure if that's an initiative that is already current in, in Australia. It certainly does pose some uh, significant issues about data privacy and, and data sharing. Um, but that, the use of data to drive policy, I think uh, the importance of that grows, grows and grows. Um, and one of the, the thing I, uh, uh, final thing I really want to mention before I get to the ashes, which I know you're all um, uh, desperately, desperately keen to hear what the conclusion is going to be, um, the, big, the big, big enabler, the big thing that was critical for the introduction of universal credit was the introduction of what we call real-time income data. So employers previously used to, used to provide a, a bulk payment of their national insurance payments to the inland revenue on a monthly basis but it wasn't split by individuals. That was all reconciled after the end of the tax year. Uh, in the last 18 months, all firms have had to reprogram their payroll software so that they can provide monthly returns, sometimes more frequently than monthly returns, individual by individual for now in excess of 90% of employees. So we have now got information that is reliable on 90% of employees in pretty much what we call real time. Um, and because that data doesn't have to be validated in the same sense as, as data provided by individual claimants, um, that enables the administration of universal credit to take place in a way actually where you're getting vast amounts of information in, but you're not, it's not costing you an arm and a leg to validate it. So uh, it's been critical for universal credit to be able to be paid on a monthly basis in work to have that information. But we're using that information now in all sorts of different uh, ways, very much in its early days, because it's only starting to come uh, through. Um, but we can now use it to monitor the employment outcomes from, say, our private providers. So actually, are they getting people into work? We can get that information now pretty costlessly, as opposed to rely on administrative procedures to get that information that then needs to be uh, validated. Similarly, we, could we can now start to think about um, uh, writing uh, contracts to for providers who are going to get people to progress in work because we can monitor how their wages evolve over time. So actually, you know, can you set up some arrangements where some mentoring or some training or support enables people to progress in the labour market? And actually, if somebody's going to invest in that, could we reward them because there's a, a saving to the state as a consequence? Um, we can now monitor pension contributions pretty much in real time and whether our reforms to pensions uh, are working. We can automate uh, much more easily child maintenance uh, assessments um, and actually, the, in a kind of big data way, matching this data with other data has actually been uh, really, really important for teasing out elements of fraud and error uh, in the benefit system. So we are really in the foothills of, of this stuff, but there's an example of where better data opens up opportunities for policymaking that simply didn't exist uh, before. Um, and as an analyst, obviously, I, I, I like data, so uh, I'm a big fan of this stuff. Uh, so finally, uh, the ashes. Now, uh, um, uh, now, no doubt you, many of you thought that it was all about batting, bowling and fielding, um, and that uh, the fact that Australia might be just a tad better than England at the moment uh, would explain the difference in performance between the teams. But I can assure you that is not uh, the major uh, driver, and I'm uh, pleased to say that as an economist, uh, it turns out that it's entirely to do... Um, <laughs> It's entirely to do with the relative unemployment rates uh, of the two countries. So uh, this is uh, based on an econo econometric analysis uh, of trends in the ashes by Douglas McWilliams, Professor Douglas McWilliams. He's not a cowboy um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the, the, the very thin slivers of shading is when England has held the ashes. You can see not, not, uh, not particularly uh, uh, dominant. Um, uh, but it turns out that whenever the UK economy starts doing well uh, relative to uh, Australia, uh, England's cricket team loses, um, is broadly 
the conclusion. Um, and it turns out at the moment, with our employment rate soaring and our unemployment rate plummeting, that we're going to get completely stuffed next year, uh, I think is broadly our conclusion. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to nip out now to the bookie to put a few quid on it, uh, it's pretty much a cert. Um, so the power of analysis for you. Um, so conclusions. Uh, there's never been more going on in the Department for Work and Pensions at the moment. Uh, I've shown you a few examples of what we are up to. There are as, at least as many that I haven't talked about um, in any detail that are just as radical. Um, the fiscal context is critical. Uh, you can't understand anything that we are doing without understanding that we have a massive hole in the public finances that we are trying to solve. Um, all of the problems that we face really are sort of long-standing issues that we have been trying to tackle for many years, issues that countries around the world have been trying to tackle for many years. I don't think anyone has quite nailed any of this. And that therefore, actually, uh, the key thing is, as we experiment in each of our countries, it's really, really important that we uh, learn uh, from each other about what works um, and what doesn't work, which is one of the reasons uh, why I'm here um, after uh, Melbourne, I'm off to Canberra for a series of meetings, and I will learn a lot there. I'm going to learn a lot here in the conference uh, for the next uh, three days. Uh, it's been uh, great uh, having an opportunity to come down here. And Alan, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I'll pause there. Thank you. <laughs>